the natural rate of interest is zero by Matthew Forstatter and Warren Mosler. State Issued Currency The primary defining institutional arrangement characterizing the relevant context is that of a tax-driven state currency and flexible exchange rates. By state currency, we mean to indicate there is a government that taxes and has a monopoly of issue. A flexible exchange rate is commonly, commonly referred to as a fiat currency. In other words, a state-issued currency convertible only into itself, Keynes, 1930, as opposed to a fixed exchange rate policy such as a gold standard or other convertibility to any other commodity or currency fixed by the state, issue, by the state of issue, such as currency boards, pegged currencies, or monetary unions. Examples of such monetary systems concurrently include the United States, Japan, and most of the world's industrial economies, including the Eurozone, although the individual nations are no longer issuers of their currency. There is a long tradition of analysis of state currency, or state money, referred to by Charles Goodhart as the Cartalist or Chartalist school of monetary thought and which he has contrasted with the Medalist, Mengarian Monetarist Tradition, 1998. While authors such as Joseph Schumpeter, 1954, passed down a view of chartalism with a misplaced emphasis on legal tender laws, resulting in something of a legal or contractual version of chartalism, Goodhart has made clear that the fundamental insight is that the power of the state to impose a tax liability payable in its own currency is sufficient to create a demand for that currency and give it value. Recent research into the history of economic thought has revealed substantial evidence of past support for this thesis regarding tax-driven money. We now know that, throughout history, many more economists understood the workings of tax-driven money and many, if not most, currencies in history were, in fact, tax-driven, contrary to what was previously thought to be the case. See, for example, Ray, 1998-2004, Bell and Nell, 2003, and Forstatter, forthcoming. The idea of a tax-driven currency was once common knowledge. It can be found in the writings of economists and others going back to Adam Smith, and beyond. Smith well understood that taxation is the key to understanding the value of state money. In fact, he used the American colony's issue of paper money as an example. See Smith, 1776, 1937, pages 311 to 312. So did a diverse array of economists that came after him, including John Stuart Mill, William Stanley Jevons, Philip H. Wicksteed, and John Maynard Keynes, among many others. A key distinction is that between the government as issuer of a currency and the non-government agents and sectors as users of a currency. Households, firms, state and local governments, and member nations of a monetary union are all currency users. A state with its own national currency is a currency issuer. The issuer of a national currency operates from a different perspective than a currency user. Operationally, government spending consists of crediting a member's bank account at the government's central bank or paying with actual cash. Therefore, unlike currency users and counter to popular conception, the issuer of a currency is not revenue constrained when it spends. The only constraints are self-imposed. These include no overdraft position, provisions, debt ceiling limitations, etc. Note that if one pays taxes or buys government securities with actual cash, the government shreds it, clearly indicating operationally government has no use for revenue per se. When the U.S. government makes payment by check in exchange for goods and services, including labor, or for any other purpose, the check is deposited in a bank account. When the check clears, the Fed, 
that is, government, credits the bank's account for the amount of the check. Operationally, revenue from taxing or borrowing is not involved in this process, nor does the government lose any ability to make future payments per se by this process. Conversely, when the U.S. government receives a check in payment for taxes, for example, it debits the taxpayer's account to the amount of the check. While this reduces the taxpayer's ability to make additional payments, it does not enhance the government's ability to make payments, which is in any case operationally infinite. In the case of direct deposit or payment by electronic funds transfer, the government simply credits or debits the bank account directly and, again, without operational constraint. The government of issue in such circumstances may be thought of as a scorekeeper. As in most games, there is no reason for concern that the scorekeeper will run out of points. On the other hand, non-government agents can only spend when in possession of sufficient funds from current or past income or from borrowing. They are indeed revenue constrained. Their checks will bounce if there are not sufficient funds available. Given that a government of issue is not revenue constrained, taxation and bond sales obviously must have other purposes. See Bell 2000. As we have already seen, taxation and the declaration of what suffices to settle the tax obligation serves to create a notional demand for the government's otherwise worthless currency. The process can be viewed in three stages. Number one, the government imposes a tax liability payable in its currency of issue. Number two, faced with this need for units of the government's currency, taxpayers offer goods and services for sale, asking in exchange units of the currency. And number three, the government issues its currency, spends, in exchange for the goods and services it desires. The non-government sector will be willing to sell sufficient goods and services to the government to obtain the funds needed to pay tax liabilities and satisfy any desire to net save financial assets in that unit of account. Note that, from inception, and as a point of logic, in order to actually collect taxes, the government, as the monopoly issuer of the currency, must logically spend or lend first. Note that it would be logically impossible for the government to collect more than it spends, or run a budget surplus, unless it had already previously spent more than it collected, past budget deficits. Thus, the normal budgetary stance to, ex to be expected under these institutional arrangements is a budget deficit. The government budget deficit is also normal, in the sense that it is the mirror image of the non-government surplus in the basic macro-accounting identity, government deficit equals non-government surplus, where non-government surplus includes both the domestic or resident private sector and the foreign non-resident sector, which includes foreign firms, households, and governments. It is therefore equivalent to the well-known identity G minus T equals S minus I plus M minus X. Government budget deficit equals domestic private sector surplus plus foreign sector surplus, where the foreign sector surplus is another way of expressing the trade deficit. The government budget deficit permits both the domestic private sector and the foreign sector to net save in the government's unit of account. Only a domestic, go only a domestic government budget deficit permits the domestic private sector and foreign sector to actualize their combined desire net saving. We are now in a position to demonstrate our proposition. The natural rate of interest is zero. First, to reiterate the argument thus far, under a state money system with flexible exchange rates, the monetary system is tax-driven. 
the federal government as issuer of the currency is not revenue constrained. Taxes do not finance spending, but taxation serves to create a notional demand for state money. Spending logically precedes tax collection, and total spending will normally exceed tax revenues. The government budget from inception will therefore normally be in deficit, which also allows the non-government sector to net save state money. This in fact has been observed in all state currencies.